Okay, so uh, just to introduce, actually, the uh, well, you might be the oldest member of the faculty, aren't you? I thought I was, but I'm the one, but who's, been, yeah. I'm the one who's been coming the longest. <laughs> <A> well matured red. <laughs> so uh, David Bowdler, who's been part of the almost since the beginning. Uh, no, from the beginning. From the beginning, right? <laughs> okay, thanks, John. Um, now, I'm, I'm aware that cough is calling, and I'm aware that um, we therefore don't want to take too long. So I'm going to try and do a little bit of a gallop um, through endoscopy. Now, this has already come up a few times this morning, and people have been saying, Turano, you know, why aren't you using an endoscope? And it's a very real question. So a quick skip through the outline of endoscopy, and then I want to actually open uh, a bit of a discussion on it. And if I can make this thing work, this is technology, so I might have some trouble. Um, I told you. Ah, no, I have it. So, oh, the otoscope versus the microscope. Very quickly, just to outline the differences or what it gives you. Is it really uh, something which you, you should be using in isolation? Or is it simply another tool like the laser or anything else that we use? So, the microscope definitely <laughs> gives a better image. Um, yeah, okay, technology is a wonderful thing. Um, so the microscope does undoubtedly give a better image than the endoscope. Um, it gives variable magnification, which, um, we'll just do some moving while we go on with this. But anyway, it gives you variable magnification, which the otoscope doesn't. Um, it, you've got two hands, which you haven't with the otoscope. Uh, the microscope gives you a head-on view. And in fact, that's great for many things, but it is also its weakness. Um, the otoscope, however, does increase your ability to look around corners, and that's why people were challenging from the delegates this morning to Renault. Um, and so it also means you can do minimally invasive surgery, and that's particularly, for example, in the field of second look mastoid uh, or intact wall surgery. And it can see round corners. Now, the ability of it to see round corners is actually quite important. Um, as this, um, if it comes up. Now, you know, the thing about technology and videos is that they never work when you want them to, do they? Um, or has the whole system gone down? Huh? Yeah, no, it's actually just the video. So I can't really do that. So I'm going to skip it, given time anyway. Now, the thing about endoscopy is the thing that worries us is the sinus tympani in particular. That's not to say the attic uh, and the uh, facial recess are not relevant, but the sinus tympani is the big deep hole, which we always find we get, you know, it's the most common place for residual disease in cholesteatoma surgery on an intact wall technique. Um, so it's quite important that we're able to actually see it. And obviously an otoscope allows us to look round the corner, which is not possible um, with a microscope. And you can get different degrees. Um, you can get 0, 30, 70. There's also in here a 45, which is actually probably quite popular if your pocket is somewhat limited, because the 45 gives you something between the 30 and 70. 70 is harder to use, so the 45 gives you that compromise. You've only got to fork out, um, you know, 1,500 or 1,500 pounds, which is now, you know, um, worth about 2,000 euros and $4,000. Um, and it allows you to look around. So the, generally, I, I like to have all three available. I, I use the 11 centimeter um, as the most convenient size. Um, if this video will run, and I'm Damned if I know whether it will or it won't. Um, run, damn you. It's not running, is it? No. Okay. Great. Uh, I love it when, it when the technology works. So the reason we use them, therefore, or the otoscopes, um, we use them, the clinic in the first instance, because you can see a lot more in the clinic environment with your otoscope than you can with a microscope, because it allows you to look around corners. And then, of course, therapeutically, um, you can do all the other things which you've already mentioned. Otoscopes don't come without risk. Um, there's the local risk, i.e., particularly when you're using a 45 
or a 70, you can very easily hit the ossicles before you get down to the area where you want to do your imaging. And that is a potential problem for the inexperienced. So you need to be aware of that. You can also damage the facial nerve by leaving it down there too long and shining the light source on the facial nerve. And so you need to be aware of the fact that there are these potential risks. I've already gone through um, the types of scope and you'll notice I like the 11 centimeter ones. The 2.7 on the 1.9 are my chosen preference. The 1.9 in particular when you're operating is really nice if you're doing second look intact wall surgery because the 1.9 goes through your posterior tympanotomy. And so that means that you can actually view the whole of the middle ear without the need to raise the tympanic membrane so that if you haven't got any residual disease, there's no need to lift the drum. You can put your ossicle, your, your prosthesis in through the posterior tympanotomy without the need to raise the drum. And that, there's an advantage to that. Um, so diagnostics, I just want to briefly touch on. It improves your accuracy. So for example, if you look, um, and this is an otoscopic view with a zero degree, but with a microscope, as you can imagine, you would not be able to see the depth of your retraction pocket. And it's quite impossible with a microscope. However, if you throw in a 30 degree endoscope, you can see the full extent of your pocket. Now, I do think that makes a difference to your ability to work out what's going on at the clinic level, let alone the operating theater. And I'm not going to dwell on that, but you know, also it allows you to see the whole of a cavity. Horrible things, aren't they, cavities? They shouldn't be allowed in modern surgery, but never mind. Um, it allows you, for example, to find out what's going on here around your incostapedial joint. So when you throw in the 30 degree, you can see all of that is now becoming visible. But you can't see it with a microscope, so you can't pre-plan in the clinic. In Ness, you use an otoscope. Um, we can use it therapeutically in virtually any operation on the middle ear. And this is the bit that really I want to discuss with you. So you can use it in any of these operations. And there's now increasing amounts in the literature of people who are using um, the endoscope as a primary tool. And of course, there are advantages. Um, as we've touched on before. It's minimally invasive, you get good visualization. Uh, you decrease the risk, particularly in cholesteatoma surgery, of residual disease, particularly in that sinus tympani area, okay? Um, shorter duration, don't believe a word of it. It takes longer, okay? Um, it assists in your placement. So you know what it's like, although we've got all these nice fenestrated prostheses at the moment, when you're trying to check the position, and particularly when you've replaced the drum, say, in um, second look surgery, it, you know, using the otoscopes does allow you to really check that you've got the position right before you finally put the eardrum down, because you can go in from it inferiorly and check your position. So there is an advantage to that. Um, faster rehabilitation, well, if you're using a minimally invasive or pr pr approach from the beginning, then that's certainly true. Cheaper, again, don't believe that. That's not true. Uh, a, because the surgery takes longer, and B, all the technology associated with the endoscopes cost money on top of your microscope. So it does reach, however, the areas that the microscope um, can't reach, and once again, the video great, uh, is running but obscured. <laughs> so anyway, we won't worry about that. Um, limitations of the otoscope. The biggest limitation I would suggest is the fact that you get the blood contamination on the scope, which means you constantly have to pull it in and out. So unless you've got an anaesthetist who drops your blood pressure, not your blood pressure, but the patient's blood pressure, down to around 70, 65, 70, you know, so the kidneys are still just about perfused, then you have a real problem. So you need really good anesthesiology for this type of surgery. Um, the other defect is you are operating with only one hand, in effect, whereas with the microscope you can use both hands. It does take a while to get used to using it. Um, so, you know, there are downsides to it, but overall, Obviously, I believe very strongly in autoendoscopy. What I'm having trouble with 
is the question we now come to. You know, using it diagnostically, using it surgically, or do we use it in isolation? And that's where I'm beginning to have problems. I, I, I've just written a chapter in Scott Brown with two co-authors. One of my co-authors is a surgical endoscopist. He, he used the endoscope for procedures, David Pollier. I'm less keen on it. I believe you use it as an adjunct to the surgery that you're doing. And that's what I like to throw open to the floor. What do or what should we be using the otoscope for? Should we be using it from the outset of surgery to do the whole procedure? Should we be using it as an adjunct? And I have a little bit of a problem with using it as a primary visual modality throughout the surgery, as I've said. I'd just be interested to hear comments from the floor. You represent, by the way, Neil, the floor. Well, I, um, you know, I, I don't think I would use the word should in, in, in my answer. Uh, I would say you should use whatever, uh, you know, works best. I think, for me, I'm very comfortable with the microscope, but there's no doubts that the microscope limits your view. Uh, and you can do um, better work if you have the uh, if you have the endoscope available to you. So well, I do. Can I just throw a, a googly? And this is a bowling term. Oh, I mean, a googly or a doustra. <laughs> it's a bowling oh. term in cricket, okay. which you wouldn't. Don't know. know anything about that. No, a curveball. A curveball. A curveball. Okay. Yeah. Come yeah. On. Come on, speak English. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm sorry. I'm, my Americanese is just not up to it. But okay, so would you you would you believe that there is an advantage to using the endoscope to the microscope in stapes surgery? Let's make it more specific. I would say in most stapes surgery, probably not. I'd say there's not a lot of advantage. But again, I'm not, I don't do it. So no. uh, you know, maybe I'll have to hear from D someone does, who does it and says that there is advantage. Well, so John looks like she wants to... Uh, well, you've put him at a sticky wicket, really. <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> very good. Um, That's a good thing. Uh, well, it depends, you know, it depends I'll, I'll on how much him. grass is I, on the I pitch. I have 365 days to teach him something. Um, so this came up at the American Otologic Society meeting in May. And uh, the presentation was about the extra added time and uh, uh, discomfiture in the OR when trying to do purely endoscopic ear surgery. And... Um, so I kind of took a poll of this group of otologists in the room, and the majority use it as an adjunct. There are a few people, and they run courses, uh, using it as a primary means. But there's always a microscope available. So it's not like you're saving the money on a microscope. Um, right. And I, so I think uh, the majority of us use it the way you are describing. Uh, and then there are a few are raising a flap with it. They're making themselves one-handed surgeons. But then when you watch some of the videos, they're using Mark May's old uh, two-surgeon technique for endoscopes, where mm -hmm. one guy's holding the endoscope and the other guy's using two hands. Yeah, of course, I, I think you'll find that actually what I'm finding interesting is younger surgeons coming out of training now are more inclined to this. It's a bit like, you know, the beginning of rhinological sinus surgery using endoscopes, which I think, you know, it's easy to see why you would do that in, in, in rhinology, because you can't use the microscope. But you are finding younger surgeons now beginning to come out, say, yeah, I want to, I want to do, uh, use the endoscope as my primary modality. Yeah, Dave, the, the problem in the UK is a good example at the moment is theatre time is costed out, depending on who you talk to, at somewhere between 800 and 1200 American dollars per hour. Um, my colleagues who are beginning to use endoscopes to do endoscopic moringoplasty working up in the attic are taking three or four hours, some of them, to do the operation. Some of them do for that an on a microscope. For an operation that is being paid by the government at round about $2,000. So they're not bringing in this technique at the right time, medically, financially, politically. But it's a great technique, and it's a great adjunct. Like the laser is great to have with you when you're doing stapes surgery, but you don't 
have to have it. I would rather we continued to do stapes surgery than our healthcare system turned around and said because of the cost of the fibres you have to stop doing it. And it's our job over the next few years to introduce these techniques and bring pressure to bear showing that it gives better results but I'm not sure that now certainly in our healthcare economy is the right time to be spending hours doing an operation that can be done in 30 to 50 minutes. However, using it as an adjunct to see the anatomy, the, the residents have not understood. I've beaten my head trying to teach them where the sinus tympani is, and with one swoop of an endoscope, you can teach yeah, them. Yeah, you can then see whether you're clear. And I think mm. also, if, you're, if you've got a middle ear disease, not like the case we saw today, but maybe a little superior, where you're not sure once you've removed it if there's disease in the mastoid, you can look back there and save the patient. And okay, let, let's, just, let's just take that case that we saw this morning. Just a show of hands. Who would have used the otoscope in that case this morning that Renault was doing to look? And then well, to as look. an adjunct, yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, and who would not have used it? Any hands up for those who would not have used it? If you didn't put your hand up, why didn't you put your hand up? Somebody. I think it depends on the confidence of your visualization with the microscope. And so in his case, he could see the margin. So he, he was confident that he didn't need to look further. You were looking at a loose stroma cholesteatoma there. And with the best will in the world, you can find skip lesions further anteriorly, superiorly, etc. I, I would argue that you There's couldn't no go harm in having a look. Sorry? There's no harm in having a look, and it no. may be worthwhile. Okay. Yeah. So I, I, mean I think it's coffee time. We can discuss this this afternoon. Yeah. I, I mean, the other one, of course, is endoscope in, in stapes surgery, and I'll nail my colours to the mask. Bollocks. I honestly mask. can't see the benefit. No. You've got to make a hole anyway. Well, there was and a... endoscope yeah. measures what? Two there was a paper in... in um, yeah. Um, the um, Auto Neurotology yeah. Journal uh, last month yes. about um, a series using the yeah. otoendoscope. And there was no advantage yeah. at all. It was kind of, well, it makes no difference, sort of thing. Yes. So why waste your time? Yeah.